Good afternoon. My name is Brigitte Kroon, and I, today I will talk about the second part of the book, which is about making a business case for human resource management. Today, I will talk about what it means to make a business case. I will talk about which organizational outcomes matter in the business case for human resource management. I will introduce the concept of resources, and I will introduce the concept of resource-based theory. All these concepts are important for chapter two, three, and four. So before I move on, let's, uh, let's take a moment to think about what it means to talk about making a business case. When you make a business case for something, it means that you suggest to a stakeholder, for example, an organization, to invest money in something that the organization has. This can be people, but it can also be materials, or it can be, for example, working with somebody uh, from outside the organization. However you, you make it, you invest money in a resource with the attempt to eventually make a better performing organization. Well, if you read the re human resource management literature, you'll find out that this, that this language of making a business case, investing in people, is very central to human resource management. So let's have a look, for example, at a very famous uh, definition of human resource management. If we take a look at the definition of uh, Jackson, Schuler, and Yi Yang in 2014, they wrote an excellent overview article of all the HRM and performance uh, uh, literature. They define human resource management as the sum of all the strategy, policy, procedures, and day-to-day -day acts that together aim to guide employment relations in organizations, and now mind you, towards the goals of organizations. So it is all the strategy, policy, procedures that together aimed to guide the employment relationship, so the relationship between the organization and their employees, but with the intention to realize the goals of the organizations. And of course, this needs to happen uh, in the alignment with all the contextual conditions, such as the organization characteristics, large ones, small ones, uh, industry, are we service industry, or are we uh, manufacturing, um, what does the comp competitive environment look like? What does the labor market look like? What are the legal and institutional settings? And what are societal dynamics? So this latter part of the definition will be elaborated more on in part three and four of the book. In part one, we'll focus on the first part of this definition. So the strategy, policy, procedures, day-to-day -day acts that aim to guide employment relations towards the goals of organizations. Well... What are these goals of organizations? Because if we make a business case, we might as, well, might as well want to understand what kind of goals organizations want to improve. Well, this is a list that is often used to illustrate what kind of outcomes matter for organizations. Of course, on the top of the list, you see operating performance, so everything that eventually leads to making money in organizations. So productivity, sales, product quality, loyal customers, um, financial performance, so the profits, return on assets, return on investments. But then it comes to, uh, already closer to human resource management, so also employee performance. So investing in resources can lead to better employee, uh, employee performance. So, for example, uh, employees staying in the organization rather than leaving the organization, replacing people is very expensive. Uh, employees being motivated and uh, contributing to the performance of organizations in, uh, with their best efforts is also very valuable for organizations. In sum, the value added per employee to the, uh, to the product, to the outcomes of the organization. Of course, there's also innovation, so employees could contribute potentially to the development of new products and new services. Um, and of course, organizations also have more these intangible outcomes that, before, for example, they want to be the top employer, they want to be the top whatever you want in, the, in their competition. Well, the um, um, word resources is, uh, is used a lot when we, when we talk about the outcomes. So there's an idea to invest in resources and then you will uh, have better uh, uh, performance. And this is a very central topic in, uh, in, in many organization theories. So before we move on to understanding these theories, it is important to understand what we mean by resources. So let me give you an example. 
So um, resources are essentially anything you need in order to realize your outcome. So imagine that you want uh, to build a house. Um, the better your resources, so the more money you have, the more materials, but also the nicer the architect um, is who, who builds your house, the better capable this person is to, to, to design a, a beautiful house, the more or the better your house will look like eventually. So in the definition of resources, you see that this, is, this one is really broad. Resources are basically any tangible and intangible feature that enable actors to realize their goals. So features, remind, materials, money, processes, people, knowledge, um, and actors contributing to the, to the goals are also part of these resources. So these can be individuals, the collab collaborations between individuals, the organizations, and the countries. The grandfather, the godfather of resource-based theories is, uh, is Joe Barney. And, and I will elaborate a little bit on his theory to make you understand how important it is to take this resource perspective if you want to make a business case and make organizations better performers. So by this resource-based view, um, nests entirely in the idea that once you invest in resources that dis distinguish your organization from your competition, you will have a unique set of capabilities that will help you outperform other organizations. Take soccer. If you have an excellent team that works together very, very well, existing of high-performing individuals, chances are that you'll do better in the competition than you are when you have just a, a club of Sunday amateurs. But Barney, um, in his theory, says if you want to understand the resources that matter to organizations, you need to distinguish three categories of them. First one is physical capital. So these are all the things that are on the bank account of the organization. Um, the offices, the factories, uh, all the machines, the materials, the computers, so all the hardware of the organization is part of the physical capital of organizations. Second, the Barney distinguishes organizational capital. The organizational capital is already a little bit more difficult to capture because it's more difficult to count and it's definitely not on the, on the balance sheet of a company. But these are all the um, systems of routines that determine how the work is done in an organization. And there are two types or subtypes of organizational capital. First, there is structural organizational capital, which are uh, the organization strategy, the HR systems, the planning and control systems. So these are all the systems that, you, that are written down in, in handbooks or they are uh, like algorithms or they are a kind of visible and easy to trace. So if you want to understand an organization's strategy, you can go, go and have a look at their website and there it is. You can read the strategy, the mission and the vision of an organization. Another part of organizational uh, Capital is social organizational capital. Um, social organizational capital is nested in the people that work in the organization. There's all their internal and external relations. So people knowing other people in the organization, knowing who to go to if they have a question, knowing who to ask if they need something to, uh, to make, uh, to realize their day-to-day -day work, but also relationships with customers. These are oftentimes not only contracts, but a, a relationship with the customer is also nested in the individual relationship with one employee and a customer. So these are important sources of capital, because if there's a good relationship with the customer, a customer is more likely to, uh, to come back to the organization and do business. But it's not on the balance sheet, neither is it very well to observe. So it's a difficult resource to, uh, to capture. So rem remember that, that's important for the theory. And the final set of resources are human capital. And human capital is defined as all the knowledge and skills that exists in all the employees in the organization. So whereas organizational capital, and especially social organizational capital, is about the group of people, human capital is in essence what all the knowledge that is nested in each individual in the organization, and for sure, if you add, all, add them all together, then, for example, the average workforce can be better educated. 
or the average workforce can be more knowledgeable because they work, uh, they, they have a longer tenure and they work longer together. So these three resources, according to Barty, are very important for organizations to reach to a unique set of capabilities that distinguishes one organization from their competition. Um, and the better an organization is able to, to, make, to create a, uh, a set of capabilities that is uh, very efficient and very um, powerful, but also very unique, the more the uh, position of the organization is there to outperform other organizations. So what does it look like in a model? It's like this. So Barney claims that uh, if a set of resources together is sustainable, rare, non-transparent, and non-transferable, and I'll explain what those are in a moment, Together, this will lead to a unique cap capability of the organization, a capability meaning being capable to make a very good performance, being able to outstand in all the performance outcomes that matter to organizations. And this is what is called competitive advantage. So what is meant with sustainable, rare, non-transparent, and non-transferable? Sustainable means if I have a resource today, it will be there tomorrow. So I can, have, I can be lucky, I could have money today. If I invest it, my money is gone. So how are you to make sure that you have money, buildings, that, um, that, are, yeah, that, you, that you can build, that you can rely on? That's the first thing. The second thing, if you have a resource that is rare, it's, of course, uh, beneficial to the organization. So imagine that you're a restaurant and you have uh, a perfect spot, you know, center of the city, um, historical building, that is a rare resource that is difficult for other restaurants to compete with. Still, these are buildings, money and things. Um, but it can also apply to, uh, to other resources. Where it becomes really interesting, if you, if you look at uh, resource number, quality number three and quality number four, so non-transparent means that it's for outsiders from the organization difficult to understand what is really happening. So what are, for example, the processes that are used in those restaurants to create these delicious meals? Um, so the final one, the non-transferable part, that means that it is very difficult to take a resource out of the organization and put it somewhere else. So for example, if, a, if a, I'll stay with this restaurant idea, um, if the restaurant is well known for its atmosphere and its team culture and it's, uh, you know, they know all their customers and, uh, by name, um, and that, that's one of the, the reasons why a restaurant is really successful. But if you take out just one person out of that organization, you put them in another organization with new clients, all this knowledge about clients, all, all this working together with colleagues, all these, you know, all these, all these things that worked in the one context will not work in the other context. So that's what we mean by non-transferable. So, summarize, if an organization manages to create a set of resources that is sustainable, rare, non-transparent, and non-transferable, only then will they have a unique set of capabilities that will contribute to creating a competitive advantage and therefore, of course, realize all the outcomes that matter for organizations. A closer look, so where do you human resource management compare to all these criteria for unique resources? So we distinguish physical capital, organizational capital with two elements, the procedures and structural, or the people that work together, the social part, and human capital, so what's in the minds of employees. Um, and we have these four criteria that m create unique capabilities, sustainable, rare, non-transparent, and non-transferable. Physical capital, the money, the machines, the, the buildings, sure, they are here and they are hopefully also rare. Um, so that makes them uh, a relatively unique cap capability. However, other organizations can also buy the machines. Also, other organizations can have um, similar things. 
So sometimes if you have something entirely new, for example, a new product, there's a, a short while there when there's a first mover advantage, but, uh, but after a while, competitors will jump up uh, and the same thing, they think, hey, this is cool, we are going to do the same thing. Something similar happens with, uh, with the structural organizational capital. So you can, you can have a unique strategy for your company, um, but after a, a while, competitors may say, hey, this is an interesting strategy, we can actually do exactly the same and also make money, and then you also all of a sudden are facing competition in the same field. So the downside of physical and structural capital organizational capital is that it, it is, they are transparent and they are transferable. When we move to the people side of organizations who are nested in the social organizational capital and human capital, we'll see that here it is more true that these are non-transparent. So what, is, what, what does it make what, uh, what an how an organization works together effectively? Um, I used the example before about a, uh, an employee who holds a very good relationship with a client. Well, this is something that is not visible. Uh, and even if, you, if, if it is to some extent visible, it's, again, it's non-transferable because, you know, the client, the, the employee is what links the client to the, uh, to the organization. Similar about human capital, uh, especially the human capital, so the knowledge that is, uh, that is related to processes that are specific for one organization, so all the implicit understanding of how we work together, about organizational procedures, about just experience how things are done, are done best. This human capital is tied to the context of, of organizations and is very different to transfer to another organization. Whereas, for example, general education, like a university degree or some kinds of skills um, uh, diploma, of course, that can be replaced, uh, referred to another organization. But especially the human capital that is business specific is very difficult to take out of an organization and go uh, place somewhere else. So, according to Barney's idea of uh, resources and the resource based view, Social and human capital have the highest value for unique capabilities. And this is because uh, social and organizational capital and human capital, they are stored in the minds and in the behavior of people in the organization. And if people leave the organization, they will take their skills, their knowledge, uh, and their network with them. So th they are lost for the organization, but also they cannot be used in the, uh, in the other organization. And this is because the transfer of skills, knowledge, and social uh, relations that exist within the context of this organization is really, really difficult. So this brings me to the end of the overview clip of part two of the book. Now you know that organizational outcomes matter for making a business case, so you need to understand a little bit of this business language. You also need to understand the value of resources to realizing competitive advantage and the importance that people in organizations contribute to creating a competitive advantage. So people in organizations create a unique organization capability for a competitive advantage. There's a load of research evidence for the HRM performance um, relationship that can support this business case. Um, and in the chapters to come, I will elaborate on those. The next clip, you will have a first explanation about, we will talk about the social and human capital and social exchange theory.